We now present For the Record. Just ahead, we are checking in with Senate leadership about how he will wield his new supermajority. We'll put an emphasis on some important bills that the governor might veto to try pass the Senate version of it, so we have an opportunity to do a veto override. Plus, a hospital staffing crisis is just getting worse. The impact can be longer waits in emergency departments, especially if you need to be admitted to the hospital. And later, a massive political spotlight on the Midwest going into the 2024 president. Race. Yeah, I think the Midwest is correctly seen as really the battleground of the battleground states. Welcome to For the Record, I'm Naomi Coles. As the state legislature gets busy writing the next budget, one of the big decisions is deciding how to apply tax cuts with billions in the state's rainy day fund. Senate Majority Leader Devin Lemahieu is with me in studio this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's just get in, get right into what I know has been one of the biggest plans that you've touted for this coming cycle. You know, earlier this year, um, I actually spoke to Representative Mark Bourne, co-chair of the Powerful Budget Committee, uh, a month or two on this show where he tells me, you know, it's unlikely for the flat tax rate plan to go forward in this budget cycle, but something perhaps in the future. Where does that stand now? Is that something that's going to come this year? Right. So my idea in introducing a flat tax plan, it, it, it's a four-year guide plan path to a flat tax um, over four years and we do a two-year budget but it was just to show that it can happen there's a way to get there and to talk about overall tax reform in the state of Wisconsin so um, we've you know over the last eight tw 10 12 years we've worked really hard on reducing the tax burden on Wisconsin uh, families hard-working families and the one area where I, we're not really competitive with our neighboring states um, is with our income taxes so I felt it was important to um, sort of highlight that and get the discussion started that there is a way we um, right now Illinois has a lower uh, has a flat tax and it's lower than our top two tax brackets Michigan same state same you know situation where they have a 4.25 percent flat tax and I was moving to a flat tax so in a very competitive environment with our neighboring states I felt it's important to start the discussion early and show that there is a way to reduce the income taxes on the hard-working families of Wisconsin and make us competitive with our neighbors so I think my question would then be it's a your, your plan is a four-year plan right mm -hmm. only really reaching that true flat flat tax status at the end of that four years in this next coming biennial budget will we see the, the first two years of that plan rolled out my hope is that we do make major um, changes to our tax our income tax rates um, especially the top two where most full-time employees are paying the top two rates uh, where we're really an outlier in in the upper Midwest and uh, so uh, you know it's not helpful when right out of the box the governor says he's not going to touch the top tax bracket um, which is where we're really out of line with our neighbors and if you look all the way from you know from New York to California outside of our neighbors in Minnesota we have the highest top tax rate in the entire continental USA. So we definitely need to, need to address the third and the fourth tax brackets to make us more competitive. So those would be the two that we might see a change to in this coming uh, I'm cycle, hopeful. the third and fourth. Okay. I'm hopeful. Um, it, I, I know that it's, you know, uh, Wisconsin Policy Forum analysis, they, they put out a uh, analysis of both your plan and Evers' plan. And obviously, I know, I mean, you've addressed this before, but th there's been criticism that it only attacks the, or uh, attacks is the wrong word, but you know, it, it creates much larger tax cuts for those highest income brackets than it does for the lowest brackets. Um, obviously, Evers' plan is much different. Where in the middle do we expect to meet this year? Is there any common ground that you think both yourself and the governor and Robin Voss will sign off on? Well, the problem with Governor Evers, well, there's a lot of problems with Governor Evers' uh, tax cut plan. Um, first of all, since it's a tax credit, it doesn't address small business owners, people who are the main street business owners who are S-Corps, things like that, because they're passed through businesses, so they don't get the tax credit. And that's, you know, 75% of businesses in this state get no tax credits with Evers' tax plan. The other weakness is, is that um, under Evers' tax plan, every county can increase their sales tax and that's a regressive tax and he's saying that my tax plan is only you know tax cuts for the wealthy he's adding sales taxes which is going to adversely affect those who have the hardest time paying you know sales tax so um, there's some real stark differences um, between uh, the governor's plan and what I want to do and I think all my colleagues generally agree with me that we need to flatten our tax code our income tax code make it fair simpler um, whether it's my plan or anyone else that flattens our tax code hopefully we can get that done in the budget 
So let's pivot a little bit to Senate leadership. Uh, we just saw an election that put uh, the Senate back in two-thirds majority, which means essentially a supermajority that can override vetoes in the Senate only. Um, how does how do you think that will affect your leadership of the Senate in this coming cycle? You know, it, it's very early to tell. Um, I think we'll put an emphasis on some important bills that the governor might veto to try pass the Senate version of it. So we have an opportunity to do an, a veto override. Um, it gives us some you know, procedural advantages on the floor with with a two-thirds vote. Um, but f most importantly for me, it was holding on to the A Senate district, um, a, a district that's been Republican for quite a long time, uh, giving us a nice advantage, a 22 to 11 advantage. Um, so that way, you know, we can get important legislation done with, with 17 votes, 18 votes, things like that. So I think it's just important that, you know, that we have a strong majority and we can hopefully get some good things done for Wisconsin. But you were also very clear that that supermajority isn't going to be exercised in perhaps perhaps political impeachments, if I could use that phrase? Yeah, I mean, there hasn't been a political impeachment in Wisconsin for over like 120 years. It's somewhat unclear how the process would work in the Constitution, um, but there would need to be cause and, you know, cause and a crime. And, uh, you know, that's something that's very serious. It's a high bar to meet. And I'm not going, I don't intend to use it to, you know, undo the will of the people with an election that just happened, for example, with the Supreme Court. There needs to be an actual cause for doing it, not just, you know, overturning the will of the people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on in this coming budget is education, right? I, I think we're starting to hear there's been, I believe, two budget hearings that have happened now, and education mm -hmm. has been a really common theme in both mm -hmm. of them. And I want to talk specifically about increases to state-imposed revenue limits for schools. Are we going to see any changes to those state-imposed limits in this coming budget? So we, uh, the governor's... Um, K-12 plan in his budget seems a little unreasonable, putting $2.7 billion into education. Uh, that's a very, that, that would be like four times the biggest increase we've ever given K-12 education. We, I think we understand that, you know, what we did in the last budget um, with, you know, using federal money, ARPA money for schools to balance our budgets, that we realize that there is a need to invest in K-12 education, what that number is. Um, and I think we still need, at some point, need to work on revenue limits as well, per pupil limits, because you know there is a wide variation um, between school districts you know that those limits were put on in like 1993 and uh, you know we've had some easing of it over I think it was about six years ago where we increased those per pupil limits um, but there's still you know a disparity be between some school districts with what they can spend per pupil so you know we'll look at addressing all those different areas but I mean the important thing is just to make sure that there is enough money going into education so the schools can you know accomplish their job you said at some point. Do you think that point might happen in this budget cycle? Or are we talking years from now? You know, it's, it's very early in the budget cycle. Um, we're still having the hearings around the state, but we look forward to making investments not only in K-12 education, into local government, into infrastructure, you know, all the important functions of government, as well as providing tax relief. When you have a $7 billion surplus, that means Wisconsin taxpayers are paying too much. So it's a time to uh, reduce that tax rate and give some, some money back to the hardworking taxpayers of Wisconsin. Anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to talk about? No, we just look forward to uh, once again providing a responsible budget for Wisconsin, a budget that set us up with this $7 billion surplus, putting it on the governor's desk, and, uh, and hoping that we can continue to move Wisconsin forward. Senator, thank you as always. Thanks so much for taking your time this morning. We appreciate it, and we will be right back.